Once again, I'm Sophronia Scott, the director of the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, and welcome to Poets and the MFA. This is a virtual open house where you'll learn more about our program and uh, receive excellent learning from two of our poetry faculty. We are a low residency program. We offer two residencies twice a year. It's a two year degree, but you do not have to leave your job or your home to participate in this program. It's for people who uh, are looking for an intense level of study, uh, but do not want to be full-time on a campus. You attend the residencies and they are intensives where you attend lecture, workshops and readings. And during that time, you are paired one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor. You develop a study plan that includes a reading list and a schedule of when you will submit packets of work, five packets once a month for five months. And that is the work, the coursework of your program. Now with this type of intense learning, you move fairly quickly you are going to develop a strong proficiency of writing skills, including the use of organization and structure and adept use of language and forming and communicating well-developed ideas with creative thought and expression in selected genres. You'll have a strong understanding of craft. And by that, I mean, you're going to understand how your writing works. You'll have a language for craft, the ability to lecture on technique and the ability to read and think critically as a writer. We also believe in professional development, that as a writer, you should understand how your work can get into the world. So we uh, feature knowledge of the publishing industry with editors, agents, and um, publishers of small presses, for example, so that you have an understanding of where your work can be published. I am not going to introduce Ben and Leslie just yet because I wanted to tell you more about our residencies. We have one in the summer, one in the winter. In the summer, we are on campus at Alma College at the Wright Lapine Opera House. It's a beautiful location, a historic building that was renovated from the ground up by Alma College. In the winter, and this residency is coming up in December, we are at the Ralph A. McMullen Center. Again, a beautiful facility in the northern woods of Michigan, about an hour north of Alma. Starting next year, January, we will also offer the option of doing your winter residency at Oxford University in England. And you can learn uh, more about all of these residencies on our website. We feature a range of visiting writers and publishing experts for our first residency. Uh, the Poet Laureate Joy Harjo uh, zoomed into our residency to deliver a craft talk and a reading that was very well received by our students. And all of our visiting writers and faculty uh, deliver readings. Uh, the summer reading series, of course, featured all of our faculty as well as Khalid Matawa, a, a visiting writer, uh, in addition to Joy Harjo. And this will happen in the winter as well. Usually these readings are open to the public. I, I love these photos from our first residency. Uh, what's great about them is that you get a sense of community, what it means to attend Alma in person. We were so happy to be able to have our residency in person. Our one coming up in the winter will also be in person because this is where our community grows. We get to interact and it's it's like the magic happens in between the lectures and the readings where we hang out at lunch where we continue the conversation about writing over dinner um you know right before bedtime all of these uh all of these air locations where you can just be together and you'll see the the bonding happens pretty quickly because you're with your people who know exactly what it is to care about writing uh, we offer three genres fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. You'll hear more about poetry this evening. Uh, a single genre uh, option is where you would only do one genre for the two years. A mixed genre degree. Uh, when you're at residency, you attend all of the lectures, regardless of genre. And that usually piques an interest in at least dipping your toe in the water of a different genre. So you have the option of doing one term in a second genre. You could experiment with poetry. If you want to go all the way in with two genres, we do offer a dual genre concentration where you have to attend an extra residency and um, do another term. So you would be doing three terms in your major genre and two terms in your minor genre. 
Now, I want to go back to Leslie and Benjamin so that they have time for their lessons. Uh, we have with us Benjamin Garcia, whose first collection, Thrown in the Throat, was selected by Kazin Mali for the 2019 National Poetry Series. He works as a sexual health and harm reduction educator in the Finger Lakes region of New York. A son of Mexican immigrants, Benjamin received his BA from the University of New Mexico and his MFA from Cornell University. Benjamin had the honor of being a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow, the 2018 Contamundo Fellow at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival, and the 2017 Latinx Scholar at the Frost Place Conference on Poetry. He is the winner of the 2018 Puerto del Sol Poetry Contest and the 2019 Julia Peterkin Flash Fiction Contest. His poems and essays have recently appeared or are for forthcoming in Agni, American Poetry Review, Boston Review, Missouri Review, and Crazy Horse, Lit Hub, and Breakbeats Poets, Volume 4, Latin Next. Leslie Contreras Schwartz is the fourth Houston Poet Laureate. She is the author of three collections of poetry, Black Dove, Paloma Negra, Fuego, and Night Bloom and Cenote, a semi-finalist for the 2017 Tupelo Press Dorset Prize, judged by Ilya Kaminsky. Her work, including essays and short stories, has appeared in Pleiades, The Missouri Review, Pank, Iowa Review, Verse Daily, and Catapult. She has collaborated or been commissioned for poetic projects with the City of Houston, the Houston Grand Opera, and the Moody Center of the Arts at Rice University. Leslie was born in Houston, Texas, with Mexican-American and Mexican roots, going back several generations in Houston and Texas. She's a graduate of the Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College and earned a bachelor's degree at Rice University. She has taught at the University of Houston and Rice University and teaches community workshops and is a speaker on the topic of mental health and poetry. Thank you. I'm going to stop my screen share and I believe uh, Benjamin is going to go first this evening. Hi there. <clears throat> I just wanted to say Thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited that uh, you're interested in our program. And just seeing those pictures, Sophronia, like brought some, like, I wasn't expecting to get emotional seeing them, but I, I totally did. Um, yeah, I mean, I love, um, I love the atmosphere at, um, at Alma College. And um, I wanted to focus today's um, mini lecture on the topic of image. Um, it's going to involve a little bit of, uh, of interaction. So part of it will be me talking a little bit. We're going to read a poem. Uh, we're going to read it with sort of the eye of a, a writer, um, which is something that when we're going through the program um, is one of the things that we do and one of the um, things we try to cultivate when we're writing um, essays, critical papers, uh, but not just for that reason, also because figuring out how a poem is working is gonna be really helpful for us in our own poems and to figure out how they're working and where, how to get them to where we want them to be. Um, so I wanted to focus on image because I think that it's um, a really powerful tool for poets. I mean, writers in general, but poets especially. Um, I think that it's really immediate. Um, it's something that can grab attention quickly. Um, and it's also one of the tools that we can access a little bit more easily um, in poetry uh, because we're kind of, we use our senses all the time. We, sometimes we think of imagery as just being visual, uh, but actually imagery is gonna be anything um, that has to do with the senses, right? Um, and because it's one of the easier ones we can access, I think sometimes that it's actually overlooked. I think that it's easy to um, bypass like how powerful just one image can actually be. Um, because we have so much to say, right? And we wanna say those things. Um, image can be such a powerful tool in helping us say the things that we wanna say. Um, we're not just floating bodies. Sometimes when I'm, you know, uh, reading work and I see a, a new poem, um, it kind of feels like, well, there's a lot of thoughts here, right? Um, but sometimes I'm not feeling an emotional resonance or impact, right? Or um, these are great ideas, but I don't have something solid to tie them into. Um, 
you know, and then there's like, sometimes it gets oversimplified into showing and not telling. Um, you can totally tell. Telling can be part of it, absolutely, right? Um, so it's not always show is better than tell. It's that showing sometimes it can be a very appropriate way of getting your ideas across. And so um, I think image is really, really, again, uh, important for poets um, because our speakers and our poems also have bodies. They're not just floating around as thoughts, right? Um, and I think that's because image has to do with the senses, it pulls a reader out of their head and onto the page, onto the physical world that you are creating. Um, and even if we don't always understand an image, uh, it can be something really enjoyable. So sometimes I read poems and I don't even know what they mean yet, <laughs> but the images make me want to go back to it, right? It makes it um, rereadable and rereadability is really important, right? You wanna keep your readers engaged and if they don't understand it, want to understand it. Um, so I'm going to go into the exercise. Uh, well, actually, before we get to the exercise, we're going to read a poem. So I'm going to share my screen with you. I'm going to read this poem. Um, we're going to be focusing on uh, the use of image and on senses. So. Um, um, okay, so the poem that we're going to focus on is by Theodor Retke, and let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, I'm going to read this one out loud. Uh, if we were in person, I would have folks read it out loud so that it's not just me talking, um, but you can read it out loud on your own. Uh, Root Cellar. Nothing would sleep in that cellar, dank as a ditch. Bulbs broke out of boxes, hunting for chinks in the dark. Shoots dangled and drooped, lolling obscenely, obscenely from mildewed crates. Hung down long yellow evil necks, like tropical snakes. And what a congress of stinks, roots ripe as old bait. Pulpy stems, rank silo rich, leaf mold, manure, lime piled against slippery planks. Nothing would give up life. Even the dirt kept breathing a small breath. Right. Um, so this is a very short poem. And short poems are hard because <laughs> you only have a small amount of space to say what you want to say, right? Um, and image can be a way of packing in emotion, of packing in concepts. Um, it's really condensed. It's a way of condensing language. Um, and there's so much here that evokes the senses, right? Um, yes, visuals, but it's also going to be, you know, in this root cellar, we can smell, right, what it uh, would be like to be in this root cellar, right? We get this idea that it's dank as a ditch. And I'm going to shift over to, to my notes. So you'll see sort of when I'm reading a poem, these are some of the ways that I kind of approach it. And um, I start with a title, right? So a title gives me a lens um, of what I'm going to be reading or how I should be reading it or uh, situates me in some way. And so this poem, the title is an image. We have root cellar. I can picture that, right? It's not a basement. It's not a wine cellar. It's a root cellar. It has a specific purpose, right? Um, and it situates me. So that title is already doing so much in terms of uh, work because it's an image, but also setting. Um, and we can just jump into the poem and we know exactly where we are, right? Uh, nothing would sleep in that cellar dank as a ditch, right? That cellar was not just smelly, it was dank, right? Um, and dank as a word choice, I mean, we can go into the, the diction in this poem so much, like we could approach it in so many different ways. Um, but dank, right? Kind of like stank, stink, right? But also dark. Um, so that word is doing a lot of work in it. Um, and that image of a ditch, right? We have seen a ditch. We know a ditch is not somewhere you want to be. It's not pleasant. Um, you try to stay out of them, right? Um, 
Bulbs broke out of boxes, hunting for chinks in the dark. Shoots dangled and drooped. We get two lines, and we get so much action in those lines. There's verb, 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 verb. Next line starts with a verb, right? Um, so we get all of this action. They broke out. They didn't just come out of boxes. They're breaking out like, you know, um, they're fugitives. Uh, they're hunting, right? They're looking for stuff. Um, dangled and drooped, um, not just hung there, right? They dangled, they drooped, right? We're using uh, diction to create those images. Um, so it really matters in how we're describing something. Um, sometimes we wanna speak in the plainest way and that might be the most appropriate for that situation. Sometimes we want really specific words, especially if we're working on a small poem, that's gonna do that work and like establish what we're looking at um, and also give us mood, give us setting, um, give us some emotion, right? Broken hunting and dangled and drooped and evil snakes and tropical, you know, like this is kind of a menacing environment. Um, and even just lolling obscenely, right? That obscenely is a really interesting word, right? It's an uncommon way of describing um, something that's hanging. And it, it's not just vile to be in here, it's obscene, it's worse than that, right? Um, and we get mildewed crates. So another image that's really strong and it's in the world that we're creating. Of course they're mildewed, right? Because we're in a ditch basically. Um, we are getting that smell of mildew. It's such a uh, particular and like unforgiving smell. Like, you know, you know when you smell it. Um, we go down, right? And we continue to get these images of um, a new way of looking at just roots, right? Like these are just, you know, I've had potatoes, this is embarrassing. I have potatoes that are overgrowing, right? Like in my, um, my cabinet where I keep them. And yeah, they're kind of like yellow evil necks and tropical snakes, right? There's something kind of creepy about them. Um, when we get to what a Congress of stinks, right? Um, what an interesting way of describing that, right? It's like that word Congress, um, I've never seen that used for stinks. It's kind of like it's a collective noun, like when you get a collection of uh, owls to parliament or a cle collection of flamingos, it's a, a flamboyance. Uh, for crows, it's a murder, right? Um, a Congress of stinks, it's like a collective noun, right? Um, and it also gives the smells agency. It's like they gathered there for a specific purpose, like to sign a declaration of something. Um, and we like we just get barraged with all of these images. Roots ripe as old bait. Um, I wouldn't use ripe with the smell of bait because I know that bait is um, really strong and fishy and like you know pungent. Um, but they were ripe. Like that's how they're supposed to smell, or that they're ready, you know, for something. Um, really strong image, not just visual, but smell. Smell can be a really um, powerful trigger for memory. Um, and so it's, as a writer, we're looking at how other poets are doing that so that we start to get a sense of how we might be able to do that in our own work. Um, leaf mold, manure, lime piled against slippery planks, right? We get this list. A list can be such a powerful thing because it, and you, you don't have to tell us you know, this place was menacing and it's overwhelming to be here. You can just give us a list of really powerful selected images and I can feel overwhelmed. I can get that um, without, you know, being told that. Um, I'm still being told really important information. I just am now experiencing it instead of just passively uh, hearing about it. Um, and then we get to nothing would give up life, right? We saw that before, nothing would sleep in that cellar. So it's this callback to that. And it's kind of this revision, it's this epiphany moment of, oh, like maybe it's not that they, they weren't sleeping, it's that nothing would give up life, that things were 
um, fighting to live, right? That they are, they have agency, that there's so much going on. We think of a root as something that maybe is slow or asleep, especially in a root cellar, which is where you put them to like for winter. Um, but actually the speaker starts to realize, you know, they're actually alive. They want to live uh, and they're fighting for it. Like even the dirt is breathing a small breath, right? <laughs> um, and that's also such a powerful image, not only, but we're letting that image and that diction do a lot of that work. You know, why use dirt here instead of calling it soil or earth, right? Because dirt is the, like the, the least, um, I don't know, noble of those <laughs> or like the least desirable, right? Um, dirt is associated with dirty versus earth, which we associate with planting and soil uh, with planting. Um, even the dirt kept breathing a small breath. And then we'd give the call back again to that aroma, like the, oh, we're breathing the smell of the earth, but that's its breath. Right, like we're we're getting its 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 breath and its fight for life. So so much done in that uh, small poem with just the use of image. I have a little exercise. Um, you can, if you're here in person, um, shut off your camera for this if you want. Um, this is interactive. You can get a piece of paper. I recommend. You can also write on your computer, but um, I would recommend getting a piece of paper. Um, if you're watching this as a recording. Um, you can leave your camera, you don't have a camera, so you're fine. Okay, so in this exercise, <laughs> what we're gonna do is um, close your eyes, um, if you're comfortable doing that. Um, sometimes it can help to kind of feel your body and to push out the external um, senses or the, uh, information that you're receiving right now. Uh, and think of a room that you know really well. Maybe this is a room that was important in your childhood. Maybe it's a, a room that's really important to you right now. Um, maybe this is, uh, like for me, my grandmother's kitchen was really important, right? And I can describe all of those smells and sounds that happened in that place. Um, maybe it's the room of someone who's moved out. Maybe this room is, um, like we just had root cellar, maybe it's a basement or an attic that has um, in, things that were, are important and you keep, but that you're not ready to throw away, right? Um, so find that room and spend a moment in there, just kind of, what would you see in there? What are the colors? What are the shapes of things? What objects are in this room? If you picked up an object, what would that object be? What's something concrete in it? If you brought that object to your nose, is there a smell to it, right? If it's a baseball glove, it's going to have that leather, leather stank, right, <laughs> or something. Um, Put, bring it to your face and what does it smell like? Um, listen for sounds. What kinds of sounds happen in this place? Maybe not, you know, in this moment that you're experiencing it right now, but when I was in my grandmother's kitchen, boy, there was so much sound. The TV was on, people were talking. Uh, there was a table in the middle of the kitchen um, and that's where everyone gathered. Um, there were dishes clinging, clinking, right? There was a door opening and shutting, opening and shutting. And my grandmother, you know, yelling at us to, to close that door or um, there was burned tortillas, right? Like that's a smell that I is really, um, for me, uh, has so many memories. Um, and, and like a burned tortilla uh, is usually because you got distracted doing something else, right? Um, and even like a burn a corn tortilla is different than a, than a flour tortilla, it has a different smell, right? So you have access to all of that. And you can give us access to that too with those images, 
with the word choices that you have, right? Um, so now take a moment and make a list. Make a list of those objects, of those smells, of those sounds, right? This is not a poem yet. This is just, we're getting into that space. And what we're interested in is what is our body doing here? How does it feel? Why does it feel that way? You know, and right now, just list those things off. You can come up with better phrasing like, you know, pulpy stems and silo rich and leaf mold and all those compound words later. Um, right now, it's just sort of building that atmosphere. And we're not going to have time to do this, but I can show you how to um, start using like other people's um, work and how it inspires you to start making your own poems. Um, this is just an exercise. This is not necessarily creating a new poem yet. It may lead to one later. But if you read this poem, uh, Root Cellar, if you start to kind of replace some of the descriptions here, right? So if you are in this room that you imagined, nothing would blank in this, right? And then the, the what room is it? Nothing would stay silent in this kitchen. Right? For me, if I'm thinking of my grandmother's kitchen, right? Um, instead of dank as a ditch, I might describe it, you know, um, smoky as a casino, because my grandma was always smoking, right? Or also because sometimes things burned in there. Um, also because my grandma liked gambling, right? Or, you know, smoky as a bingo hall, right? Um, and these are places that have sounds. And now I have something that I can pull from and that's visually, you know, casinos have all of this ding, 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 ding going on, right? Maybe I can connect that to the ding, ding, ding of plates. Um, maybe I can uh, hear all of the commotion of, you know, somebody winning at something um, and hear an echo of that in like someone winning a board game, which we would play on a kitchen table, right? Um, so that you can start to see how to build your own world and, and bring us into it. Um, and if you give us that richness, we're, as a reader, we can't help but join you, right? Um, I've never been in a root cellar, but I have because I read this poem. So I'm going to pass it on to Leslie and uh, just thank you for uh, if you played along with us. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. That was so interesting. And that I love that poem and embracing the senses. So rich. I, I agree looking at the pictures. Um, it, we have such a warm community at Alma and um, it goes beyond writing. It's this sense of purpose um, behind our writing as a that's very generous. It's a giving um, of ourselves, of our experiences, sharing them. Um, so I'm going to jump into my topic. I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share. Okay. So my lesson today is focusing on how do we write about difficult emotions and trauma? So everything from violence, sexual assault, racism, all those heavyweight topics um, that honestly uh, we're brought to the page originally from different tra trauma. Um, and I wanted to start with this quote from Mark Doty. Um, you know, why do we write? Why? we have this urge to describe as writers. Um, and he says, what we want when we describe is surely complex to solve the problem of speechlessness, which is a state without agency, so that we feel impressed upon 
hold on a second, I can't see my screen, by things, but unable to push back, to refuse silence so that experience will not go unspoken. When the most accomplished poets bring to bear on the project of saying what's here before us, it is possible to feel at least for a moment language clicking into place. When language seems to match experience, some rift is healed. So when we write about something traumatic experiences, not necessarily, they don't have to be personal, but we are giving ourselves agency as artists and people. Um, some of the difficulties that we have tackling subjects like this is that our impulse is to, you know, gush on the page and use melodrama. Um, it comes across as overwrought in language um, and it's unsatisfying ultimately because it becomes one dimensional or too simplistic. And one of the tools that we can use as writers um, as finding connections with the reader that we built um, through syntax, through different points of view, um, playing with structure and form to really try to create a multi-dimensional uh, experience for the reader of what this traumatic event was like or what this experience was like. So, some of the poems I'm about to show you show different approaches to writing about trauma. So I, I picked poems that are about uh, experiencing racism, um, historical racism, and um, personal, and a poem about sexual assault. Um, so just take care. I'm letting you know these poems are deal with heavy subjects. So the authors, they use these tools to grapple with the content, um, structure and form, authorial distance, you know, how close the speaker is to the subject, um, playing with point of view, and using tools of figurative language, extended metaphors, similes, using that imagery that Ben was talking about, all the texture of an experience in the senses um, and other suggestions I'll, I'll mention at the end like uh, that will help you um, find a way into talking about a difficult topic. Like you can use archetypes, symbols, or shifting the gaze away from the experience itself. Okay, so this poem is by Eve L. Ewing from Electric Arches, and I'm going to read it. Um, this is a poem that is narrative. It begins out um, pretty straightforward with simple diction and syntax, and then halfway through the poem, uh, the the experience is reimagined. So I'm gonna just go ahead and re read it and then talk about it. Four bo Boys on Ellis, a retelling. As I was getting into my car, I saw the lights flashing and the four of them sitting on the curb. CPD stood over them and the university police were looking on. I drove up and pulled alongside and asked what was going on, if their parents had been called and informed that they were being questioned. Their heads were down. One officer told me that the youngest was nine years old. He said they were suspected of stealing a phone. I asked if they were being arrested or if it was legal protocol to interrogate them without an adult present. Another officer began to yell at me, standing next to my car and shouting through my window. He told me to leave. I would not. So we have a clear break there. And notice what happens in the handwritten section. 
I put the car in park and closed my eyes. I concentrated very hard, picturing the boys at home eating cereal and watching Naruto. I, I don't know what that show is. When I opened them, the police were shouting and jumping into the air, grasping at the boys' shoelaces as they drifted upward into the clear night. Their bikes went up too, and they managed to climb atop them mid-air, which was impressive. They seemed to have forgotten the police and didn't notice me and looking at each other and smiling and singing as they flew. So these poems, she has several like this in her book. She is literally changing the narrative. Um, the fact that we, we can, um, based on the first half of the poem, we know what is going to happen, something violent and she took that off the page. It's off stage, but we still understand its significance. In the, the section in the latter half of the poem is providing social commentary and bringing you know, uh, some of the intellectual connections um, and also gives us a perspective of a child. This is very playful, a playful way to reimagine the experience. Um, she's using structure um, and shifting the experience, this traumatic experience. Um, at, at the moment of intensity, that's where she changes the perspective and even the, the language, the syntax is, is um, different than the beginning, which is more like a transcript. But I'd like you to see another poem by the same author. So I think I, um, that's the next slide. So this poem um, deals with war. So Ilya Kamensky um, in this book writes about civil unrest um, in an occupied town, a fic fictitious town. And notice how he it uses line breaks, M dashes, to add silence around these extreme moments of intensity. He doesn't, he shows himself struggling to talk about something that is witnessed. So I'll read it. That map of bone and open valves. I watched the sergeant aim the deaf boy take iron and fire into his mouth, his face on the asphalt, that map of bone and open valves. It's the air, something in the air wants too much. The earth is still. The tower guards eat cucumber sandwiches. This first day, soldiers examine the ears of bartenders, accountants, soldiers, the wicked things silence does to soldiers. They tear Gora's wife from her bed like a door off a bus. Observe this moment, how it convulses. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like a paper clip. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like the body of a boy. I touch the walls, feel the pulse of the house, and I stare wordless and do not know why I am alive. We tiptoe this city, Sonia and I, between theaters and gardens and wrought iron gates. Be courageous, we say, but no one is courageous as a sound we do not hear lifts the birds off the water. This is an extremely difficult poem and it's central to this book, um, which centers the, the murder of this young boy, boy who is deaf. Um, and hold on a second, I'm gonna pull out my notes on this. So if you follow the poem, uh, Kaminsky is using line breaks, M dashes, um, varying line lengths to control the story, to pause. And you notice that there's very little description of the gruesome murder. Most of it is about the speaker's experience of trying to understand it. So like Eve 
Ewing's poem, we see the speaker grappling with ex um, being exposed to witnessing this moment. Um, I'm going to show you some more poems. I'm going to go faster than I initially had anticipated. OK, this is from Olio, which is a, a terrific book. Um, it uses historical texts and facts from uh, African American musicians in the 19th century, uh, ragtime musicians. And this is a great example of how form can be used to talk about these very important um, moments in history and uh, legacies of racism. So many of his poems are, have a preface and a postscript um, I'll show you, it's at the bottom of the poem as well. Listed out are, I think, 148 um, churches um, from 1822 onward, uh, African American churches that were bombed or burned. And so he puts these, he frames these around these beautiful poems about singers and musicians um, to put, put the historical moment into context and to talk about such a, a big issue and give it clarity and more depth. Um, so this poem is called Fisk Jubilee Proclamation. This is a sonnet. Um, Fisk Jubilee was a real choir. Um, and he imagines them singing about uh, these other characters in the book. Oh, sing unto the world with blued song, born from newly freed throats. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna read the preface first, I'm sorry. Mother Emanuel Aim Church, Charleston, South Carolina, 1822. Cross Ankle Church, Palmetto, Georgia, 1899. George Leaf Presbyterian Church, Keeling, Tennessee, 1900. Red Top Church, Hopkinsville, Kentucky, 1915. First Baptist Church, Kateret, New Jersey, 1926. Fisk Jubilee Proclamation, Choral, O Sing Unto the Lord a New Song. Psalm 96. O oh, sing, undo the world with blued song, born from newly freed throats, sprung loose from lungs once bound with, within bonded skin, scored from dawn to dusk with coffle and lash, every tongue unfurled as the body's flag, every breath conjured despite loss we've had, bear witness to the birthing of our hymn from storied depths of America's sin, soul-worn poems, blessed in our blood through dark lessons of the past, struggling to be heard. Behold, the bold sound we found in ourselves that was hidden, cast out of the garden of freedom. It's loud and unbeaten, this soft as a newborn's face, each note bursting loose from human bondage. Fulton Street, Amy Church, Chicago, Illinois, 1927, Second Baptist Church, Detroit, Michigan, 1930, Macedonia Baptist Church, Egg Harbor City, New Jersey, 1935, Mount Methodist Church, Henderson, North Carolina, 1940, Negro Methodist Church, Loganville, Georgia, 1947. So these persona poems, um, many of the poems in this book, Olio, uh, use uh, persona poems, uh, points of view of different characters. And that allows the artist um, to look at these monumental historical moments um, in focus on the music 
the joy of the music and survival while not dismissing the real evil that was happening and continues. So that those each poem in that book, this is a description of uh, the postscripts and preface that he puts in some of the poems. Okay. Um, this is a good example of um, someone writing about sexual assault and violence and using a highly structured form uh, by, by um, pulling out a sonnet into different sections um, and redirecting the gaze. And we, we spend very little time on the actual uh, traumatic event. But we're set up as a reader to kind of be invited. We learn how to read the poem. Um, and we, because if we get the, that intense moment, we're going to turn away. So here's how the poem comes across in this form. Sonnet with a cut wrist and flies. One, blade to the soft and the soft flashed open was the breakage of robins. Two, Blood dripped to the floor, splashed on the tile, painted a big chow. Three, the slip would talk back, sweet nothing in a red gown. Wrist, noun, the corpus or lower part of the forearm where it joins the hand. To explore the joint window hinged on the edge of the body, to silence it, to peek into the cut and find the rhythm, ribbon. Five, blood veined by the rhapsodic. Six, a single mouth, its total face. So we're getting these very um, potent images in ideas, um, information about an attempted suicide, but we're not at an emotionally intense moment, you know. Seven, risk, verb. Two, to expose the chance of injury or loss, hazard to risk one's life. As the mind was made interrable, a boy stepped into, was natural in him, was his and spectacular. Eight, an arteries plucked quatrains, perfected through wreckage, a man, Waited in the pulse. Eight. Wait, that was eight. This is nine. A man found in the wrist who wanted out, but who put him in. Ten. He spoke, spoke the four languages of the heart. He would touch the boy, would. Eleven. Hurt the boy and translate his screams into a fifth vernacular. Well, the boy he entered was put into no more than an urn, than a tawdry vessel. 13, sacrifice, noun, one, a giving up of something valued for someone or something else considered to be of more value. So this is a very difficult poem. Um, I'm pretty sure there's no 14th section but the way this artist deals with um, writing about something so traumatic, um, he uses structure, white space, um, line breaks, and breaks down uh, the experience into manageable parts, um, re redirects our gaze to these metaphors, and just gives us a tiny portion of what happened. You know, often writers think if we gush on the page and write everything that happened, that it's effective, that we're telling the truth. But um, we lose connections if we don't make these choices um, to connect with a reader. I'm gonna skip this poem, but that's a, this is a great poem if you haven't read it, Walk, Walking the Chupacabra by um, Irene Lorasova. Um, this is a great, extended metaphor about um, rage and um, I suggest you read it. 
but I'm not going to right now because I want to get to writing. So I showed you these poems and I want to talk about um, trauma-informed writing practice. So, you know, just like Ben was saying, we can't ignore the body. The body is there when we write. The body is there um, when we're trying to shape these poems or these stories. Um, I want to give credit to the writer, Catherine Standifer. She's author of uh, Lightning Flowers. Um, I did a training on trauma-informed creative writing class. Um, and some of these, I'll, I'll um, mention her name that she uh, suggested as writing exercises. So trauma, as we know, activates our nervous system. Um, we're in reptilian brain survival mode, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Um, and we can reactivate our system even in writing about these issues. Um, and it's a difficult place to write from. We have to be grounded. We have to use our neocortex, our intellect, our logic. So whatever we can do to get there. And we can use tools to help us do that in our writing practice. So these are some exercises. If you're trying to write about something very emotionally powerful to you that um, is really upsetting or dysregulating, you can write, give yourself the exercise of writing about the present moment, all sensation-based. So grounding yourself, go to a place and describe it in full detail. So that's one um, example. Um, if you feel that you can write um, from a safe place, you can play with um, writing about the experience using uh, different kinds of syntax, like you saw in um, Eve Ewing's poem, um, changing tone, point of view, authorial distance, anything to interrupt a, a straight narrative, like this happened to me, or I'm writing about this historic moment that was very traumatic. Um, ways to make the reader follow you and understand the gravity of what happened. Um, forms and structures as containers, like I showed you. Um, these uh, next ones were suggested by Catherine Stan Standifer. Um, so sticky notes, breaking apart the experiences, um, using what she calls the nine boxes, trying out various perspectives, um, creating fragments or collages um, so that you have the traumatic moment just in bits and pieces, um, using archetype, card, archetype cards to write. Um, you know, often when we write about a specific character, like uh, in a poem, if you're writing about uh, a rapist or a person who was racist, um, we want to, to make it more complex. So forcing us to get out of the, to put the characters into different roles can deepen our writing. So this is barred from Catherine Standifer. Um, that this is actually um, adapted from trauma treatment um, and it's adapted to creative writing. So. You do not have to write about the traumatic experience that's right in the middle. You can, but you don't have to. You can protect yourself if you feel like it's such a, a close experience. You want to write about it, but you can't safely. So there are all of these other ways to, to move the gaze you Can write about one, when something's about to happen. Um, sorry that there's a typo. Movement in the story, you know, so go along the narrative and pick parts of it um, to focus on. So this can help you as you write. Um, that's it. I feel like I talked a lot and I'm sorry I didn't give more interaction, but um, that's just a little taste of um, one of my favorite topics, right, and important, writing about something that can be overwhelming. 
um, but we you have the the tools at hand to to make it work. Thank you, Leslie. That's absolutely fabulous. And on, honestly, I think you may have to do the full scale, like a longer version of this at residency. I think I will. It's it's yeah. something close to me. So thank you for allowing me space here to think about it. The, the topic is hugely important. And yeah, I think we, we need to spend a good amount of time on this at residency. So thank you for offering that. So thank you all for being here. I have a couple of more things to share with you if, if the computer will allow me to do that, because I know some of you may have uh, questions about the application process, which is going on right now. The application for the winter residency is due on November 1st. We uh, require your college transcripts um, from your undergraduate and if you have any other graduate degrees, your CV or resume, a creative writing sample, a maximum of 25 pages for fiction or creative nonfiction, a maximum of 10 pages for poetry, no more than one poem per page. We asked for a couple of personal essays. The first one talks about your specific interest in Alma College's MFA, uh, your preparation for pursuing such a degree, uh, what you consider to be your strengths and weaknesses as a writer, uh, your goals for the program, and what you hope to bring to our uh, artistic community. We also want to know that you're a reader, that you're interested in words. So we ask for a literature essay discussing the books and writers that have influenced you. Two letters of recommendation. They don't have to be from people who know your writing, because I know that that's not always the, the case, uh, when especially if you're coming into this after having not written for a very long time. But um, we do ask that there are people who, who know you, who can talk about your ability to uh, be organized with your time and to uh, participate well in the community. So uh, our website, oh, and also, sorry, the tuition. So we are $9,000 per term, housing and meals. At the McMullen Center, you have the option of a single room. So there's a single room fee for winter semesters. Uh, I encourage everyone to complete the free application for federal student aid. And the new one just opened on October 1st. So if you intend to use any sort of student aid to finance your education, I recommend that you uh, fill that out. <clears throat> on our website, you'll see a box on the left, I believe it's in the left corner, the Refer a Writer Award. Anyone can fill that up for you, a, a friend, um, a teacher, all it is is the, per is the person is giving your information and saying this will be a great uh, writer for the Alma MFA. And if you decide to attend our program, you would get a $2,000 scholarship, $1,000 for each year in that person's name. Uh, if you are part of the military, the GI Bill also um, can provide uh, funds for your education and ask your employer because a lot of people have tuition benefits at their work and simply don't know about it. So please check in with our financial aid office if you have any questions, but please don't let the, the finances keep you from pursuing this dream. We really um, believe, I know personally, my MFA changed my life. And if this is something that you want to commit to, then there is a way to make it happen. Uh, if you are still in your thinking process, I encourage you to download our MFA Decision Journal. It's basically a workbook uh, that takes you through a series of questions to help you decide uh, what does an MFA mean for you right now. And this is my email address. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I will also open it up for questions right now if anyone has questions for me or for Ben or Leslie or anything else about uh, the program this evening. And uh, you may, like Anne, I see you're on. Anne, you uh, would have to unmute yourself if you have a question.
I don't have a question, but hello. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, Court, did you have a question? I didn't know if you were talking and mute were muted. No, I don't have a question. Um, I, I was asking someone else. I, I'm good. Um, I came in late. I forgot about the time change. Um, it sounds like it was an interesting chat. Um, I've done a little bit of homework. I'm sorry I missed most of the informative information about the poetry, um, the trauma poetry. And Benjamin, I'm not sure if you spoke to that as well. Um, but I. Yeah. It's been recorded, Anne. So you will you will get the uh, you will get the link to the recording. Oh, wonderful, wonderful! Thank you. I'm sure, that goes up. I'm I've already completed my application, so I think I'm in a good place. Yay! We can't wait to see it. Am I? Is there anyone else who has questions? Uh, court, yeah, court. I think you're muted. Oh, um, yeah. Thank you all so much. I. Um, really enjoyed these um, these um, presentations and lessons and um, and learning about the program. And uh, I was just wondering, is there a um, exit requirement um, for upon graduation of the program or um, anything involved like that? An exit requirement, you mean like a? Uh, like a, a final project or something like that? Uh, yes. And let me, I think I have the degree requirements here. Yes, I do. So let me share this for you and show that to you. Okay, so in order to earn the degree, you participate in five residencies or six if you're doing the dual genre. You work, uh, do four terms of one-on-one -on -one work with a mentor completion and presentation of a critical thesis. Now that critical thesis is written in your third term and you deliver it as a lecture at your fourth residency. You complete a creative thesis, a manuscript of 125 pages for prose, 45 pages for poetry. If you are a dual genre student, you will submit a thesis in each genre. Your creative thesis, you get to choose which genre uh, that will be in, but your creative your critical thesis, you can choose the genre. Your creative thesis, you have to do a thesis in each genre if you're doing dual genre. Uh, in your fifth residency, which is your graduating residency, you would deliver a public reading of selections from your creative thesis, as well as uh, present a document reflecting on your work in the program and an assessment of where you might venture next with your creative writing journey. Uh, you will have worked with at least three different faculty mentors during the program. And you, you also have to submit uh, an um, uh, accumulative, it's hard to say that word, accumulative annotated bibliography, which is essentially the list of everything that you've read throughout your time in the program. I think you're muted, Court, sorry. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering for the, um poetry uh, critical thesis, the 20 pages, is that 20 pages of an essay or is that 20 pages of poetry? No, your critical thesis is, um, is, a, is an academic work about oh. a particular craft element um, or um, the work of a certain author, but, um, but, but that's, a, that's a study, that's a prose piece that you would submit. And that's why it's delivered as a lecture. Oh, thank you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, consider it um, not just an un, not just a demonstrating an understanding of craft and language, but it's also a bit of practice of, of lecturing if it's something that you haven't done before. But uh, but we want our students to have that piece. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well. I hope uh, Anne and, sorry, um, Court and Grace, because Anne is already submitting her application. Court and Grace, I hope we'll be hearing from you as well. It'll be uh, an honor to have you in the program. Thank you for being here this evening. This has been Poets and the MFA. 
I am Sophronia Scott, Director of the Alma College MFA in Creative Writing, along with Leslie Contreras-Schwartz and Benjamin Garcia. Thank you for being here this evening. Good night, everyone.